Responding artistically to the climate of the times, Clifford Odets became the voice of the group theater. His plays mirrored the essence of what the group wanted to be and do. They commented on the social climate of America, the politics, the hopes and fears, and the struggle to survive. There is no doubt in my mind that the group theater had a great effect on Odets. It was the atmosphere of the group, the intensity of the group, the fervor of the group, the optimism of the group, the belligerence sometimes, an affectionate belligerence of the group, and also its desire to get at the truthful expression of human feelings. Looking back, it's no accident the flowering of the group theater coincided with the group's discovery of Odette's true gift. Clifford himself said he'd never have become a playwright at all had it not been for the group. If that's true, he paid them back handsomely. In 1935 alone, Four of his plays ran simultaneously in New York. One of them was written in just three days and actually made it to the stage six weeks before Awake and Sing. I hadn't seen Clifford for three or four days. And one day he came backstage, I was back there, and he had yellow sheets in his hand. And I said, well, where have you been, Clifford? I haven't seen you for so long. He said, well, I've been writing a play here, one-act play, sort of a one-act play. I said, let me read it. I was waiting for Lefty. The play was about the taxi driver strike. And uh, it was a, a meeting in which they were waiting for Lefty. Lefty never appeared. And in the course of this meeting, there were flashbacks to the lives of various cab drivers. It was street language and, and a working class language, but it was so organized as to have a quality that was a new voice in the theater. We'll die for what is right. Put fruit trees where our ashes are. Don't wait for Lefty. He might never come. My God, Joe, the world is supposed to be for all of us. I know this. Your boss is making suckers out of you boys every minute. Yes, and suckers out of all the wives and the poor innocent kids who grow up with crooked spines and sick bones. Sure, I see it in the papers, how good orange juice is for kids. But damn it, our kids get colds, one on top of the other. They look like little ghosts. Betty never saw a grapefruit. I took her to the store last week and she pointed to a stack of grapefruits. What's that? My God, Joe, the world's supposed to be for all of us. The first production of Waiting for Lefty in New York City at the Civic Repertory Theater, Eva Legallian's mm. Theater, on 14th Street, was a night to remember all the days of your life. The audience was so with this play uh, that it was the essence of why the group theater was formed that night. It all came into flower. A shock of delighted recognition struck the audience like a tidal wave. A kind of joyous fervor seemed to sweep the audience toward the stage. The actors no longer performed. They were being carried along as if by an exultancy of communication such as I had never witnessed in the theater before. Audience and actors had become one. Line after line brought applause, whistles, bravos, and heartfelt shouts of kinship. Kazan was playing a taxi driver, and he was sensational. Sensational. He had, because it released him, because he had no inhibitions, you see, and he understood the play, and he believed in the part, believed in the play, and he loved Clifford, and he got out there, and at the end of the play, he screamed to the audience, Strike! and the whole audience scream strike. It was, it was terrific. At the end, pandemonium broke loose. That audience went wild. We, we stood on the stage with the tears rolling down our face. And, and uh, you couldn't believe that this was happening. And I felt, oh, they're going, the balcony is going to come down because the audience uh, were stomping their feet. They couldn't applaud anymore, so they stomped their feet. And I thought, they're going to tear the balcony down. I think I was quite young when I saw Waiting for Lefty. I don't know why in Jamaica. There used to be something called the subway circuit. I don't know if they toured, 
But forever after, after I stood up with everybody else and yelled, strike, the whole audience, I felt that the union movement, the CIO, AFL, were due to the group theater. And <laughs> I still think so. Calls to strike, indictments of a world built on money. I am a union man, gonna leave you behind. Life shouldn't be printed on dollar bills, goes the famous line from Awake and Sing. The spirit of revolt runs through all of Odette's work, and he and the group were on the cutting edge during the 30s. Desperate for solutions, many Americans looked to communism, including some members of the group theater. Almost everybody felt that there was no way out, out of the depression, out of the shooting of the veterans in Washington by Hoover, and uh, out of the uh, horrible morass the company was, uh, the country was in at that time. No way out except uh, socialism, the only answer. Anybody who wasn't a bit of a radical in those 30s uh, should have had his head examined uh, because the, the whole country cried out for a solution to the desperate situation that we were in. I really was very innocent and naive about the political party that was growing in the group theater, but they did have meetings every week, and they were in contact with the Communist Party in New York. Certainly some of the people in it were very left-wing, and certain some of us were uh, even quite red, you, you might say. But to call a group a, a communist or a red theater absolutely is, is it's ludicrous. The interest in uh, Russia and communism, of course everybody was interested because this was something new. If you <laughs> wanted to know about the world, you wanted to know about communism. You didn't necessarily embrace it, but you followed it closely. It was an ideal at one time. It was connected with the ideal of the theater, that it would be a collective thing where mm -hmm. art would be supported. And the great art in the theater at that time was Russian art, so that had an influence mm -hmm. too, Joanne. I don't think that any of these actors really had much political understanding or knowledge. Uh, very little. They were sentimentalists. Their hearts were in the right place. I refused to march on a May Day parade. Not that I wasn't, my sympathies weren't with almost everybody marching, but I had a matinee. None of them that I knew were genuinely political animals. That is, people who function from a political need first. When they began to think more about it or informed about it or found out it was a highly unpopular and even perhaps illegal, it wasn't illegal, but it was unpopular, and they shied away from it. They were sentimentalists, and the public and all those committees were completely wrong about them. Are you a member of the Communist Party? Or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? During the communist witch hunts of the late 40s and early 50s, a number of group members, Martin Ritt, Tony Craver, Ruth Nelson, Mars Konofsky, Phoebe Brand, were blacklisted. This is one of the group's playwrights, John Howard Lawson, summoned to testify before the House on American Activities Committee. You refuse to answer that question, is that correct? I have told you that I will offer right. my beliefs, my affiliations, and Excuse everything else to the American public, and they will know where I stand, as they do from what I have written. Lawson took the Fifth Amendment, refusing to cooperate with the hearings. Later, others, like Elia Kazan and Clifford Odets, named names including those of their former group colleagues. It was a bitter time. Many careers were damaged or destroyed. One of my greatest afternoons in the theater was I went to see Frederick March and Florence Eldridge in Long Day's Journey. Well, for whatever reason, I saw a matinee, and I saw Ruth Nelson, who was the standby, and I was stunned. I think she is one of the greatest actresses in the world. I think due to uh, many circumstances in our country, namely the blacklisting. Miss Nelson has not been acclaimed as the great, one of the greatest actresses of our time. I never suffered from this, but I suffered on their behalf. 
because they were completely baffled by what was going on. First of all, they thought being a Communist Party was not very popular, but it was like being Democratic Party, Republican Party, Conservative Party, Prohibition Party. And you chose your own party, which is a very sound American tradition. They were much more soundly American than I would say that some of the committee members were. But whatever their beliefs, the group still forged ahead, trying to make the world better by changing the theater that mirrored it. They tried hard. There was Odette's Paradise Lost, about a middle-class family facing bankruptcy. The case of Clyde Griffiths, the story of a young man caught in the throes of social injustice. What am I supposed to think? Weep for the Virgins, in which Ruth Nelson played a young working-class girl determined to make a better life for herself. I can't have my head full of trouble. Ruby, you love me. I'm going to stay right here until you remember how you loved me, those two days we had. Let go. Let me go. I hate you. Ruby. And they even tried an anti-war musical, written for them by Kurt Weil and Paul Green. In fact, it was Kurt Weill's first musical in America. But the group was still scraping along from one production to the next, seeking a solid financial footing. Finally, the directors turned to an obvious source. Mm -hmm. 